This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Shapeshift. With no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, counterparty, Dogecoin, Dash, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. And by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Unplugged NFC hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. And by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash EPICENTER and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sébastien Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with uh, Flavia Charlo. Flavia is one of our recurring guests. He's here for the second time. We already had him on last August to talk about a coin prism. And, and Flavia has this uh, great talent of just putting out project after project after project. Uh, and he's put out a new project, which is very interesting. It's called Open Chain, and uh, we wanted to get him on to talk about that and look forward to catching up. So thanks for coming on, Flavia. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we were joking before that you're basically like a, a machine, you know, like uh, producing projects. Because the first time we had you actually on, you already had two projects, and I think we only really talked about one of them. Uh, so you already had the prediction market. Pre- Predictious, uh, and then you had uh, uh, color coins, right? So you, you came up with the you invented the sort of the um, I guess most popular color coin protocol, open assets, and then you're also doing this exchange uh, or um, a wallet, color coins wallet, right? And a block explorer. So already you had a, a lot going on back then. Um, I think in French politics they call this ex- export exporting of French talents outside of the national boundaries. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I live in Ireland, so I don't live in France anymore, but uh, still French. Um. So tell us a bit. What's this? What's the status with those projects? How is Open Access doing? What about the the wallet? And and what about your prediction market? Yeah. So well, basically, I discovered um, Bitcoin. I think uh, now more than two years ago. Um, I, I kind of, you know, I've always been passionate about uh, prediction markets, and uh, at the time I wanted to build one as a side project, as for a fun project. But uh, like the the issue, you know, was like accept, accepting payments, uh, also need you know payout to users who win the predictions. So this was kind of always uh, like the the problem with building a prediction market. So when I heard about Bitcoin, I sort started to look into it. And then the more I looked into it, the more I, I thought I was the perfect uh, thing to use for a prediction market. So basically, I built a, the prediction market. It's called Predictious. It still exists today. So you can place, you know, you can place uh, money on different predictions. You know, there's politics, economics, um, you know, Oscars, uh, you know, uh, a lot of different things. And uh, yeah, so it works completely with Bitcoin. Uh, so that was, you know, my first project. That's what got me into Bitcoin. So that was in 2013. Uh, after that, I kind of, you know, when you start learning about Bitcoin, you, uh, you know, some people, they get really sucked into it. So that happened to me. And I started to read a lot about it, started to read about all the different projects that, that were um, happening around Bitcoin. And I discovered Cornot Coins. So uh, at the time, uh, that was kind of the first application, uh, like the first blockchain 2.0 or like, you know, like the first thing that wasn't currency that, that had been described. And uh, so that was pretty exciting. There were, you know, some people talking about it at conferences at the time, uh, but it was kind of early stage. So there was no, um, there was no like product at the time that existed. That was just a small group group of people talking about it on forums. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, had like um, a vision of, you know, like uh, having digital assets on the blockchain, using the blockchain for transacting. Um, so at the time, because there was nothing that existed and uh, I felt like this was, you know, something that, that had a good future, uh, I started to work on, uh, you know, on Cornot Coins and basically I kind of designed a protocol, um, like a new protocol that, uh, that that didn't exist at the time. There was, you know, just a few drafts of different protocols. There was a the white paper as well. I think Vitalik wrote the white paper, uh, but nothing was really, uh, you know, satisfactory for the use cases that I wanted to 
that I had in mind basically. So I developed this open assets. So that's the name of the protocol. And you know, because it's just a protocol, uh, nobody was really, uh, uh, you know, nobody could use it without programming stuff. So basically in order to bootstrap the adoption, I built this wallet, which, uh, which is called CoinPrism. Um, and uh, so this this is also like the name of the company now. So CoinPrism is basically a wallet uh, which is web-based where people can you know send receive uh, bitcoins as well as Cardot coins and they can even create their own Cardot coins. So it, it's everything is guided through user interface. So it takes a few minutes um, and it's pretty easy. And um, yeah, after that we built an API uh, which allows people to programmatically interact with Cardot coins. Uh, mobile wallet. Uh, I, suppose, I suppose we talked about that last time. Uh, we talked uh, to, with. I was on your show, but yeah, like a mobile wallet for Android. Um, a bunch of other things like support for uh, cold storage, uh, and so on. And um, yeah, so and then now, uh, last week actually, uh, so we just launched a new uh, new product which is called Open Chain. Uh, before we get into that, I'm curious. So what's the kind of the traction you're seeing with CoinPrison and Open Assets? Because it seemed like to get be getting uh, you know quite a bit of attention and projects being built on. Yeah, so I mean, so open uh, open assets was uh, sort of I think the first uh, protocol that was sort of usable and had tools around it that was launched at the time, and this head start kind of uh, was very useful for adoption of open assets. And um, so initially it was like just you know startups or just a uh, small like project like. Uh, groups of people who were trying to do things and experimenting. So we had like the first week after launch, we had a crowd sale, which was um, a hair salon in Australia, which wanted to fundraise some money to open a new store. So they used Coin Prism for that. It was just a week after launch. So that the, that kind of small projects. Um, and uh, over time, you know, as interest picked up on blockchain technology, which kind of happened in the past, uh, yeah, in the past uh, six to 12 months, I would say, people started to also pick up interest in uh, in open assets. Uh, and just the fact that it was like a simple protocol, which was easy to re-implement. Uh, there's, no, there's no vendor lock-in pretty much because you know you don't have to use CoinPrism to use open assets. It's like there's plenty of open source tools that exist in different languages. It's like very wide. Um, so it, uh, people started to get interested into that. Uh, also at the time uh, when Reddit wanted to make a uh, crypto node, uh, they actually chose Open Asset to do that. Well, then after there was some changes in management, and they decided they don't want to work with you know cryptocurrency anymore. So that kind of uh, fell apart. But that was kind of the big project that started to look into it. And more recently, there was um, well, there's basically Chain.com, which is a uh, it's an API provider, but they're pivoting heavily towards uh, digital assets. So they also adopted Open Assets, and uh, they they work with uh, Nasdaq, and uh, they basically uh, Nasdaq is experimenting now with Open Assets for their private market platform. So this is this is really as big as it can get. Uh, there's also Overstock, which is building their T0 platform. Uh, so they, they probably use a mix of technology and they say they want to be block, like blockchain agnostic in quotes, but they're using for the first thing they did, they created a crypto bond for uh, like a corporate bond for Overstock, the company, a $5 million bond, and they created it on open assets. So you can actually find a transaction on the blockchain, uh, which has like, you know, open asset marker and so on, which shows the uh, the $5 million bond being transacted. Uh, so, you know, now it's, it's getting uh, picked up by a lot of bigger companies. So it's not really uh, something for small companies to play with anymore. It's like something with a lot of traction now. And so all this, all this interest and traction around the open assets protocol, is it generating any business for coin prism at all, or is, are they just implementing the open standard, which is open assets? Yeah. So it's, uh, most like those big companies, mostly they usually, you know, they want they want to to deal with like bigger companies so coin prism at the moment is quite small so they so they usually they rather hire their own people their own engineers to work on the on the technology and re-implement their own stack which works on open assets which is what uh, overstock did i think they they have like a team of engineers working on that so they you know because it's such a simple protocol it's easy to build your own tools around it so uh, that's what they're doing. We're still doing some consulting with some companies which are interested, uh, you know, in uh, yeah, in open assets. So th th there's still some business here, but uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely it's a market in that's expanding. So it's uh, uh, it's gonna grow very fast at some point. So so with uh, with the Nasdaq example, you mentioned they wanna use 
colored coins on for their private uh, chains, but then how does that work? Because colored coins is a protocol that runs on top of Bitcoin. Do you know what exactly they have in mind or how that's supposed to play out? Nasdaq. So I think Nasdaq they want to use it for settlement. Uh, so in their private market platform, they have uh, they don't have so many companies listed. I think they have about sixty companies. It's uh, just private companies. It's like separated from their big uh, you know public exchange, where you know obviously you have like thousands of companies and there's like millions of transactions per day. But their private market platform is like a test bed for them. So. Uh, they have a, sm a smaller amount of transactions and uh, I think they can use it for settlement. So they can uh, probably uh, every day or even if every 10 minutes, they can um, adjust accounts. Uh, but obviously I think they might, they probably will retain the keys for that. So you won't be able to join the exchange and, uh, you know, participate as an anonymous uh, user because obviously there's a lot of regulations that, that would be uh, violated if you if you were doing that. But uh, basically, yeah, I think they use it for settlement. It's not clear exactly what they plan to do because obviously a lot of it is still, uh, uh, hasn't been really discussed yet. But uh, yeah, so at least they, in the initial press release, they said they were experimenting with open assets. Is this where the idea for OpenChain uh, originated? Or is there is there some correlation there? Because it seems kind of similar from, from the OpenChain protocol. Yeah, so uh, OpenChain, so basically, so, so I've been talking to a number of, of companies uh, uh, for some time, and uh, usually there's some uh, some questions that keep keep coming back. And uh, so one of those questions is scalability. So as we all know, uh, Bitcoin has uh, limited scalability because of you know the the fact that it uses proof of work and this, this distributed architecture. So it's limited to more or less seven transactions per second. Uh, so this is always a question that comes back and, you know, there's ways to address it with the open assets by using, you know, lightning networks and this type of things. But uh, basically you end up building a lot of things, uh, you know, a lot of complicated uh, layers on top of it. And uh, so, yeah, open chain solves that problem by just not doing all of these complicated things and just, you know, stepping aside uh, proof of work, you know, stepping inside the Bitcoin blockchain even and uh, doing transactions off chain directly. Um, so that's one question that always comes back, and another one is the control of uh, of of the transactions. So, you know, Nasdaq uh, they cannot afford having transactions being completely open onto the network and letting anybody do any kind of transactions. They, you know, there's a lot of regulations that uh, requires them to know if all the parties involved. So it kind of has to work in a closed loop. And then there's some, uh, you know, there's some other restrictions. You know, maybe the, you know. The, the trading can only happen during uh, daytime, for example. I don't know if that's the case for private market, but might be. So in that case, you know, that's another type of thing that ne they need to be able to restrict. So there's plenty of rules that they cannot really enforce easily on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's why open chain kind of provides uh, the way to do that. So the the way that I sort of see this, I mean, I we've been we've been researching this for for the last little while, Brian and I, and, and discussing it. The way that I would explain it in one sentence, and I'd like to know if you think this is correct, is it's a distributed database that gets block stamped every 10 minutes to the blockchain. Is that sort of accurate or are there parts missing there? Uh, you mean open chain? Yeah. Yeah, so it's basically, uh, yeah, it's it's a database, basically. It's it's actually built on a database, you know, because, you know, databases have been uh, around for decades. They kind of work now, work pretty well. So it's a database, except uh, we add on top of that, we add, uh, we basically hash all the transactions and every 10 minutes we take the cumulative hash of all of that and we put it in the Bitcoin blockchain. So the Bitcoin blockchain is irreversible, you know, as we know because of proof of work and it's very expensive to reverse a transaction. So this kind of ensures the immutability of everything that happened, you know, as part of this cumulative hash. So it kind of protects um, uh, against the, you know, re reversibility of the, of the ledger uh, while still providing the same scalab scalability as you get from uh, you know, a simpler system. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to talk about there and we want to come back. So we have, we have a lot of questions sort of regarding, you know, the security, the consensus, because you, you start getting in interesting discussions. I mean, Sebastian said this sentence to me before as well, but, you know, when I read through it, I was like, well, it's not actually a distributed database, right? It's a, actually a centralized database, which makes sense when the the what you are aiming for is scalability, right? Because... As soon as you start having this distributed consensus process, well, scalability becomes uh, almost, I mean, much, much more difficult at least. 
Um, but maybe before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about sort of what's the structure of open chain? How is, or what's the architecture of the protocol? Yeah, so the, the idea behind it is for every uh, organization that's issuing an asset, they would run their own instance of open chain. So if I take the example of, uh, let's say Starbucks coupons, uh, like, you know, which you can spend for, you know, dollars at Starbucks, they're issued by Starbucks. So Starbucks would, would run their own instance and that instance would control all the transactions where you have Starbucks coupons. And on the other side, maybe you have, um, well, maybe you have Macy's coupons and those Macy's coupons are con controlled by an instance that, that's uh, controlled by Macy's. And, uh, you know, you that way, uh, you know, Macy's has complete control over what happens uh, to their points. So they can set rules. You know, you can put expiration dates. You can, uh, you know, you can freeze an account if it turns out uh, a gift card has been, uh, you know, stolen from the store and, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to block the points that were on the card. So, you know, that's a lot of fraud with gift cards. So you can you can set the rules that, that match your, your business needs, basically. And so we have many different uh, instances. Um, so, you know, every organization has their own instance. And then you can connect uh, instances to each other uh, when you want to have... Let's say you want to swap a uh, Macy's coupon for a Starbucks coupon, then you you, you would have uh, they would have to be connected in some degree in some way. So either they're directly connected to each other, or they are connected to a third chain where you can do the swaps. Uh, but basically, you can form a, like a sort of a mesh network of different uh, chain open chain instances, and uh, you know transact assets depending on which connections exist. <laughs> Our show today is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins. They now support over 50 different cryptocurrencies, which includes all the non-scam coins that you have ever heard of. So if you want to trade altcoins, then there's the old way, which means going to some shady site, like creating an account, giving them your data, depositing coins, and uh, hoping for the best. Or there's the Shapeshift way, which means no account, just depositing it, and uh, in one minute, you have your altcoins in your wallet. So if you're on a website that accepts Bitcoin payments or donations, you're going to want to check out the Shifty button. It's a nice little button that you can install on any website. It just takes a few minutes to add some HTML code to do it. And uh, automatically, this little button will pop up on your website that allows users to pay you in any altcoin that Shapeshift supports. And they just get converted and you just receive Bitcoin in your wallet. We did it on our donations page. It was really easy. It just took a few minutes. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to shapeshift.io, go to the API and tool menu and check out the Shifty button. You'll see all the instructions there on how to install it on your website as well. So we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. And what about the, the structure of the protocol? Like what, what does it contain? Yeah, so uh, basically the so it's it's a simple architecture. So um, so Bitcoin needs uh, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system because there's no central authority, obviously. So um, essentially, the bitcoins are issued by the protocol itself uh, through consensus. So you you don't have a central authority. So the network needs to needs to be peer-to-peer. -peer. That's uh, that's something you have to have. Uh, but peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, it's. Uh, it's a nice tool, but there's also like some issues with peer-to-peer -peer because um, it's it's very uh, con you know consuming in terms of uh, require like in terms of uh, resources. So it consumes a lot of bandwidth uh, because you need to you have such redundancy that there's a lot of bandwidth. Uh, it, latency usually would be higher in peer-to-peer -peer systems because it's harder to optimize. Uh, so we basically also like another big reason uh, when, when there's a big issue is. Um, uh, phones, for example, or like mobile devices, they, it's hard for them to connect to a peer-to-peer -peer network because usually your uh, mobile uh, network uh, will only, you know, will block some ports and they won't let you connect to, you know, for example, the Bitcoin network or, you know, tor the torrent, like a uh, BitTorrent or any kind of peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's harder for mobile devices to connect to, um, to a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we've basically uh, taken a simpler approach and we've just using a client-server architecture. Uh, because we only have one node that validates a given asset. So that node can be a server. And it's actually uh, in the interest of the uh, of the organization, you know, of having uh, a node that runs well, that's highly available and so on. So Starbucks 
has uh, like a big interest in you know keeping that node running and having a lot of bandwidth and so on. So they're the ones who are going to pay for it. But the end users are not going to have to pay for it. They just connect to a server. Uh, because you know the end user shouldn't have to pay for being able to use uh, gift cards like Starbucks gift cards, uh, and Starbucks doesn't even want to have the end users pay for it. So it's it's uh, it's better um, alignment of the of the cost essentially, and it's easier for devices like lightweight devices like uh, mobile phone to connect to it because uh, well basically it's just exposing HTTP uh, interfaces. And pretty much every device in the world that's connected to the internet can connect through HTTP. So it's a much easier interface to connect to uh, for a lightweight device. So in this example of Starbucks uh, points, Starbucks would be the, the validator node. So they have a, a, a an open chain instance, which is just like an, an NPM, like it's a node implementation. And the participants, so the customers would be observer nodes. Uh, yeah, so so there's this concept of of observing nodes. Um, so an observing node connects to a validating node, and it receives um, it receives a copy of all the transactions as they get validated. Um, so basically, there's a, it's, it's using WebSockets. So you can actually have an observing node which is implemented in your browser if you want to. Uh, but uh, you basically connect to this WebSocket and you receive all the transactions that they get confirmed. And uh, that allows you to reconstruct a complete copy of the ledger. So you have your own copy of the ledger. You can verify everything. You can calculate the cumulative hash and uh, compare it to what's in the Bitcoin blockchain to uh, ensure that the uh, integrity is, uh, you know, that, that uh, everything is, you know, there's still integrity. You still have the correct copy and nothing has been reverted. And uh, the observing nodes, um, they have the ability also to examine every transaction. They can verify digital signatures. Uh, they can also uh, verify who's doing what. So there's this concept in uh, in Open Chain where the validator uh, can define uh, when you're when you own the validator, you can define administrators. So you define a public keys, which uh, which are the public keys of the administrators of the instance. And those administrators can do uh, things that normal users cannot do. So they can, for example, issue tokens. Um, the you know By default, uh, normal users can't issue token, although you can also configure it so that normal users can issue tokens. But uh, you know, and they can also make transactions from two accounts that they don't necessarily own. Because you know, in case of fraud, for example, they might want to revert a uh, transaction. They can also affect permissions. So they can uh, remove the permission on an account so that this account can is not allowed to trade anymore if if they want to freeze an account, let's say. So uh, when you do that, it's visible that the, this transaction, let's say a transaction freezing an account, has been signed by the administrator. So all the observer can see that uh, you know the ad administrator froze an account or the administrator reverted the transaction. And uh, you know, basically, it kind of keeps them honest, right? If the validator does something that you know they start uh, freezing a lot of accounts, the observers observers will notice, and two things can happen. The first one is they might lose trust. So if if they're customers, uh, they might uh, they might lose trust, stop using the service. And the th second thing is uh, the customers, if they believe that something illegal happened, uh, they can actually use the ledger, the copy of the ledger, in court as an evidence that the administrator did that because everything is digitally signed. There is a signature of the administrator and this can hold this can be used as an evidence in court. So it kind of keeps the validators honest. So but then so coming back to the Starbucks model would would the customers or the the, the, the customers of Starbucks be these validator nodes or these uh, observer nodes or or should it be some auditing party like Deloitte or something like that which is auditing the the validator's copy of the blockchain or not of the blockchain but of, of their ledger yeah so the customers can be observers but they don't have to they they can also just be but, uh, just I lightweight mean, if, clients if you talk about uh, the case of starbucks i mean if you talk about scalability right then you start having huge volumes of transactions so the idea that customers would run observer nodes doesn't make sense no because they would have the same number of a data the same volume that would be coming in yeah i mean if you're yeah usually i suppose uh long term it would be firms that would be uh, like auditing firms maybe that would be doing that uh for the users you know it could be like uh, consumer protection comp like uh, organizations uh, that exist in some countries they could you know check that uh, the ledgers are working properly 
Uh, but yeah, like yeah, if, depending on the scale, the number of transactions, uh, yeah, the the end users might or might not be able to do that. But at least the, it's possible for someone to do it at least. So maybe it's going to take some more money. Maybe it's going to take some resources to do. But at least it's possible to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is interesting, though, because we've had this discussion for a while, right? So there's there's been Bitcoin and there's a whole philosophy around Bitcoin, and then there's been a lot of work on on permission blockchains. And then a lot of people sort of say, oh, permission blockchain, or at least if you read Reddit, then people say, oh, permission blockchain is just a database. And this is it's sort of like a nonsensical statement, right? Because you still have a, a consensus process that administers has rules, you know. Uh, so, but, but it obviously isn't the same thing as a peer-to-peer -peer network where sort of anybody could join in the consensus process, right? So that's a, that's a clear difference. But then, of course, you can say, well, I mean, in some cases, is that even necessary? Like, do you even need to have, you know, 10 entities like administrating the process together and, and you know, voting on blocks or whatnot? Or can you just not, like, get rid of that and instead, you know, gain some, uh, you know, enormous scalability and speed and, and uh, cost savings as well, right? And then, I think OpenChain is, is that, right? It goes... Go sort of to the very extreme to say, uh, well, we don't need a consensus process. Like, there's no P2P network here. This is just a database with digital signatures. So, you know, you see who does what. I mean, at least someone sees it. And, and then, okay, you can, you can put an observer node in there. So let's say somebody has, uh, has a record of of what that sees there. And then of course you, you do get some security aspects again. I mean, how much of course that depends a lot on who runs the observer, what exactly is the, is being done. Um, but it's interesting because then, you know, in a way is, is, is this, to what extent does this, is this coming from Bitcoin and blockchain and, and, and this, or to what extent is this something that you could do completely independently and is, is not actually that related? Yeah, it's it's kind of a yeah departure from uh, from Bitcoin and blockchain. I guess it, it uses some of the ideas uh, that were pioneered by Bitcoin, uh, sort of as um, you know, Bitcoin. The the core feature of Bitcoin is censorship resistance, and it's been designed in a way that uh, it enables censor censorship resistance. And the transparency is part of you know that you need transparency to enable that. Uh, but you know, still, it's still use, useful to have um, a transparent uh, ledger, even though you don't need censorship resistance. Uh, obviously, it's not as necessary because you know people have been doing that today for you know for a while without transparency, and it works to some degree. So it's not necessary, but it's still a, a nice thing to have. And also, um, digital signatures—they're um, used today. I mean, they've been used for a while now, uh, but not completely across the board. You know, like. Um, um, there's always a bunch of systems uh, that that don't rely rely completely on trust and no digital signatures. So if you use something where it's they are enforced across the board and it kind of increases security. Uh, also, there's this idea of using the blockchain for immutability or publishing the hash, which is it's kind of a small thing, but it's still uh, very nice to have. Uh, but you know, it, it uses some of the ideas of Bitcoin, but yeah, it's still very different from a uh, cryptocurrency. So, so the important ideas that you see being used here are digital signatures. Um, so the idea that I guess every transaction is associated with a public key and, and signed. So you, I guess you see where it comes from. Um, and, and what is, is that, is that the most important aspect here that you're sort of taking from Bitcoin? So there's the uh, yeah like the transparency is is very important. The fact that anybody can uh, become an observer and replicate uh, the ledger is I think is very important. Uh, and there's also uh, the fact that you know it's a simple API. Uh, uh, it's it's you know it's easy to program against, uh, which you know systems tend to be very complicated. They have a lot of bells and whistles. But here, like the core the core API is is very simple. Um, yeah, and also the immutability is uh, is also a nice feature. But uh, yeah, obviously there's no censorship resistance because it's like the assets, the assets we're talking about. Uh, you know, you can always go to the company that holds those assets, like Starbucks, uh, if you're the government, and force them to 
to do something uh, or they go to prison. So in that case, they're going to find a way to do it. Even if the technology prevents them from doing it, uh, they're going to find a way one, one way or another. So may, either the technology is going to help them do it or it's going to you know slow them do it. But in, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen because you know, they, they're, they're, they're still uh, abiding the law. Right, right. So, and of course, one of the interesting aspects too and, and consequences of that, and I think that's the sort of a, a logical decision you made there, right, is that you get rid of blocks, right? So it's not a blockchain because, well, why do you need blocks, right? So you need blocks, of course, if like, let's say there's, there's different uh, parties administering this process, right? And, you know, they may have received stuff in different orders and somehow they've come to agreement, right? So you bundle them all together and you send them around and then somehow they all say, okay, this is the status. But of course, if there's a central server, well, what's the point of a block, right? You don't need a block. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the blocks, uh, essentially, they introduce a delay because when you submit a transaction to a system that's based on blocks, like, you know, Bitcoin, you have to wait for the next block for confirmation. So it is, first of all, it's not synchronous. You have to wait for confirmation, which is a different event. Uh, so it takes time. And even some systems, like uh, some systems based on proof of stake, they uh, reduce the block time to like a few seconds sometimes. Uh, but even few seconds is still a long time for some of some applications like um, trading, for example, is something where uh, every millisecond counts. So if you have confirmation time of two seconds, uh, you cannot use it for like, uh, you know, markets and trading because it's uh, it's too slow. So, you know, if you do synchronous uh, confirmation, so basically you eliminate the blocks and confirm instantly, then uh, then it becomes usable for uh, this type of applications. Let's take a short break so I can take you to Paris. I walked into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, in the heart of Silicon Sentier, home to many startups, including Ledger. And I spoke with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger's CEO, about the all-new unplugged NFC hardware wallet. The Ledger Unplugged is a NFC-based hardware wallet that you can use with compatible Android phones. The private keys are stored in a secure element and you can use them with wallets such as Mycelium and Gridbits. Each time you want to make a transaction, the signature will be done by the Unplugged and this way your private keys is critical data will never be exposed to the Android phone. This is a secure way to use your Bitcoins on the go, in mobility, and you will also be able to pay directly with the Unplugged with compatible point-of-sale terminals. The Ledger Unplugged is the simple solution for secure, contactless Bitcoin payments. You can get the Unplugged at ledgerwallet.com, and when you use the code EPICENTER at checkout, you'll get 10% off your order. And by the way, that code works on their entire range of products. So we'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER Bitcoin. Let's keep, stay on this topic of consensus. Uh, one thing that we mentioned earlier is uh, before the show is this idea that you know the valid the observer nodes could um, do real time auditing. So in you know in the case of of, uh, of Starbucks or perhaps like if you want to do a stock exchange, you know rather than having auditing at the end of the month or the end of the year, you could have auditing happening in real time. And the value of having the hash of all the transactions added to the blockchain every 10 minutes is that you can point to that transaction and that hash and all of the observer nodes can say, OK, this come to a consensus, I guess, without knowing each other that all these transactions happen because, you know, there's the proof of it in the blockchain. Um, does does this imply that you could have multiple observers that don't necessarily know each other and can still validate that you know these transactions took place and then what is to stop the validating node from sending different copies of the ledger to the different observer nodes yeah this is a good question yeah but you can definitely have multiple observers that don't know about each other and uh, actually it's even possible to have observers expose the transaction stream so that uh, you have uh, like a second level of observers that connect to the first level of observers and you know it kind of builds uh, sort of a, a graph or a tree, I would say, where, uh, you know, you can actually scale out nicely like this. You know, you would have just uh, four, uh, let's say four observers at the first level, and then you have 16 at the second level, and then, uh, you know, 64 at the third level. So it's it's uh, it's much easier to scale this way. And uh, what, uh, yeah, you're right that the observers could send uh, different versions to different observers. 
but if they do that, uh, the cumulative hash for those different observers will be different. And one of those observers would realize that the cumulative hash doesn't match what's in the blockchain. So the blockchain is like that part that everybody has to agree on. Uh, you know, it, uh, that's the, the one thing that uh, ensures that uh, there's only one version of history. Right. And so in, in your doc, in the documentation, you mentioned that you can do, you, you can do like a large volumes of transactions and those transactions get that hashed into the blockchain uh, and which comes up to, if you do once, if you hash, uh, if you send the hash once every block, that comes up to $10 a month or something like that. Uh, f what, what would be some of the criteria that would push an organization to say, well, rather than you know, push these to every block. We'll push them to every ten blocks or every hundred blocks, because you can you can also you can also adjust that, right? Oh yeah, you can adjust the frequency depending on your needs. You know, if you don't have a lot of transactions, maybe uh, you know every ten blocks is enough. If you do it every ten blocks, you actually save uh, ninety percent of the cost. So it's like ten dollars for every block, according to the the current fees. I mean, the fees vary over time. If you you know you divide it by ten, if you do it only every ten blocks. Uh, and, you know, if you do it once every day, then you, yeah, you're you going to pay less than a dollar per month. Um, and this is, you know, there's no point, in any case, there's no point having more anch uh, anchors than, uh, more than one anchor per block, because it doesn't add anything. You know, the block is like a, uh, it's like a snapshot in time. So, you know, if you have two anchors at the same time, it, you know, it doesn't bring uh, more. So you don't need to have more than one per block. Uh, but you know what the the maximum resolution you can have is uh, one per block, and it gives you the same level of irreversibility as you get uh, with Bitcoin. Because with Bitcoin, you have to wait ten minutes before you know that the transaction is in irreversible. So it's the same level of irreversibility. So so you know you mentioned that uh, yeah you can have instant uh, confirmations, right? So essentially that means right like let's say I make a transaction, I send it to the validator. And now, of course, if the val because the validator isn't charged, he can immediately say, "Okay, yeah, no, like transaction approved, right?" But uh, that also means there is no security there, right? Because he could throw it out again, and and there's nothing. I mean, the chain would be perfectly valid, right? I mean, it's true that if you have like the chain hashed in between, you know, then the hash, you know, you can't throw out things that let's say before the hash. I mean. You could throw them out, but at least it would be noticed. People would say, okay, well, uh, what happened here? But otherwise, uh, validators can sort of do whatever they want with it, right? They can they can go back and, and change the sequence of transactions. Or they can just block incoming transactions. I think that's what you mean, Brian, is that incoming transactions get just thrown out. You could you could put a transaction in, say, like add it to the to the chain of transactions, but then later take it out again. Yeah, so blocking a transaction is kind of their right uh, if they want to block it. As long as they tell you that it's been blocked, uh, it's fine. Uh, but um, yeah, they could, uh, like you said, they could accept the transaction, tell you that it got accepted. And uh, 10 minutes later, uh, when they publish the hash, then that transaction is not in the chain anymore. So yeah, if you don't trust the validator, uh, you might need to wait for 10 minutes uh, to be sure that the transaction has been confirmed. Uh, but usually in this kind of setup, uh, the end user would trust the validator, would trust the company because the validator, you know, you would trust uh, Starbucks to, you know, uh, tell you when the transactions are confirmed for their points, uh, that there's no point really for them to, to cheat on that. Right. I mean, another small question. So how would you, so, so they put the hash in the blockchain. Uh, how would you know, like, is it possible to see if the which hashes are like tied together with previous hashes, or like does that you have to see that from someone else? Someone else is going to say, okay, these are the hashes that belong to that open chain. Um, so basically, you when you configure your open chain instance, uh, you give it the private key of a Bitcoin address, uh, which which should have some funds. And then the the hashes are published from that address, so like okay, the fees okay. are taken from that address, and uh, so actually we have uh, one address like this for uh, for the test instance that we have. So so far there has been like five or six anchors since uh, since when we rebooted it uh, like a couple of days ago. So you know every time uh, you know every like every so often it publishes a hash there, and uh, every basically every uh, instance would have a different address that they would use. So that's how you identify. That's a nice way of handling that. But yeah, so. No, I was just saying you need to keep funding that address with Bitcoin to pay those transaction fees. 
Yeah, yeah. So you need you need like to fund it like for like ten, ten, depending on the fees, you know, ten, twenty dollars per month to make sure that uh, you can still publish the hash there. So it's using up return. Transaction is pretty simple. It's just up return and then change, uh, and then some some goes to the fees as well. But it's it's a very small transaction. Uh, but yeah, you still need to pay uh, like a small amount of fees. And so what's nice about this is that you can always look at that address and you can just see the list of transactions basically in in one Bitcoin address. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can see the the list, and then every anchor has also the number of transactions that that are uh, encapsulated into that hash. So you can track, you know, like uh, what stage every anchor is at. Let's take a short break and talk about Hi.me. Hi.me is a VPN provider. And if you don't know yet why you should need a VPN provider, let us help you. I'm sure you were like me and when all the crazy revelations came out during the Snowden time uh, of all the, the spying that is being done by the NSA and other government agencies, you were shocked and you said, not with me, not with my own rights. Now, the way government agencies can spy on you, there's many of them, but the most Easiest way is by simply going to your ISP and getting all your traffic, capturing all your traffic. And the VPN can protect you from that. It can give you a secure tunnel from your computer to any of the exit nodes all over the world so that all your traffic goes to this secure pipe that's encrypted and cannot be intruded on. And with Hike.me, you can choose any of their, their 30 exit nodes all over the world so you can enter the internet in a secure location. The best thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan, which includes two gigabytes of unthrottled bandwidth per month. So you can go to Hide.me slash Epicenter to create your free account. And when you use that URL, you'll automatically get 35% off if ever you decide to go premium. Now the premium plans are really great. They include unlimited bandwidth, access to all of the 30 exit nodes that Hide.me provides, and you can install it on up to five devices at a time. So you can have this running on your phone, your tablet, your computer at work, your personal computer, and just be completely protected all the time. And of course, Hide.me accepts Bitcoin. So we'd like to thank Hide.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Uh, Sebastian made an, uh, I'm stealing your great question, Sebastian. Uh, he, he, made please, please <laughs> he made an interesting observation before. Uh, and so, well, let me let me take a step back. So one of the things that we, at Ares, right, we do is that you say, okay, you sort of take the consensus rule, you put it in a smart contract, right? So you could have like, let's say one party in control, or you could have multiple parties. So it seems like here as well, okay, you maybe you say it's fine if just Starbucks is in charge because, you know, they can always refuse to give me the coffee anyway. But maybe also you say, well, I don't want just Starbucks in control. I want maybe these three entities in control or like you might want to have all kinds of rules regarding that. So, so Sebastian brought up a point. Yeah, well, could you run an open chain as a distributed application? Would that be possible? Uh, that might be possible. Yeah, and I haven't really thought in that direction, but it might might be possible. Yeah, but... Going back to like having multiple parties controlling, uh, let's say, uh, Starbucks transactions, or let, let's say for the purpose of this example, let's say it's like PayPal, there's like a PayPal chain, and uh, you have other companies validating the, the PayPal chain. Let's say you have also like Visa and MasterCard. And then on the PayPal chain, so PayPal chain kind of controls the funds you have on PayPal. And uh, Alice makes a payment to Bob, like $100. So Bob has has a hundred dollars, and then PayPal decides that uh, the transaction was fraud or something, and they delivered the transaction. Uh, but Visa and Mastercard don't agree, so they uh, Visa and Mastercard refuse to take that transaction. So they essentially fork, uh, assuming that you would have like this consensus, you know, with PayPal, Visa and Mastercard. Visa and Mastercard would fork into a version of history where the reversal didn't happen. So Bob still has a hundred uh, hundred dollars. But as far as uh, PayPal is concerned, uh, Bob doesn't have $100 anymore. So when Bob comes to, to PayPal and tries to withdraw his $100, he says, okay, on the main chain, I'm supposed to have $100, so give me those $100, you know, I want to withdraw into my bank account. PayPal is going to say no, because you know, as far as we know, you don't have $100, the transaction was reverted. So, and there's nothing that uh, the user can do. He can say, okay, well, look, but pay, like the other guys on the main chain think that I have $100. Right. But at the end of... But yeah, at the end of the day, yeah. you need to, to, to resolve this in court maybe, or, you know, that's the only way. So it doesn't really change the, 
uh, the bottom. Well, of the I, I don't. I don't think I agree with you. I mean, I think in, in the example you gave, that would would be an indication that the chain and the contracts. You know, if, if you talk about this being in a, like in a smart contract land or the chain wasn't set up properly, right? Because if if it's a thing where like the ultimate judge of do you have a hundred dollars with PayPal or not? It's just PayPal. Well, yeah, then PayPal should be able to make that decision. But other things, you know, you may have different rules, right? Or you may have multiple parties being in charge or so, so then you, you might still have a process of like, let's say a fraudulent payment is reversed, but you know, maybe you encode who gets to choose on that process. Like, where does it go? You know, I mean, I think there's all kinds of things you can do. I mean, you're certainly right that it's it's crucial for these kind of things that the sort of the state of the chain is in accordance with the state of you know the legal state. So you know if someone controls the sort of the reality, they have to be able to make those changes in the chain. Otherwise, it becomes um, irrelevant what you have on there. Yeah, it's tricky though because at at the end of the day, those hundred dollars are gonna live on someone's bank account. You know, maybe okay. In my case, it's PayPal's bank account, so PayPal has all the controls. Uh, but even if it's a bank account that's controlled by the three companies, it means that in that case, uh, you have some kind of legal structure uh, which encompasses Visa, Mastercard, and PayPal. And in that case, that legal structure becomes the legal structure that can be uh, that can maintain the ledger. So you kind of always have to have an owner. You cannot really have an asset that's being, I mean, as far as I know, uh, as far as law, in, is, law is concerned, you cannot really have an asset that belongs to many people at the same time. There has to be one legal owner. So that legal owner is the one that would be in control of the ledger. Um, but you know, maybe laws will change in the future, and maybe it's possible to have this kind of setup. But um, it's still very tricky. Yeah, it's definitely true that it's tricky to to get these things so right. So I was right? just going to talk about the I wanted to talk about the technical implementation. So can you describe how uh, a company would implement uh, an open chain uh, server? Yeah. So I mean, uh, like. If, if, if we go into technical details, so we have a documentation website, uh, it's docs.openchain.org, and there's like a lot of documentations, and there's one document that explains how to deploy an instance. And uh, so it it runs on, uh, right now the, the supported mode of deployment is, is uh, through Docker, which is like a container system. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's an easy way to, to deploy applications. Uh, it's kind of popular at the moment. So it's the type of thing you just uh, install Docker on your Linux machine or it also works on uh, OS X and Windows, by the way. So you just uh, install it there, and then um, and then you just uh, uh, execute the few command lines that are described on the on the on the documentation website, and and then you're gonna have your instance. And there's a configuration file which you can modify. And so that configuration file today uh, it has um, a few settings that you can change. Uh, so the first one is the public keys or addresses of the administrators. So if you want to be an administrator, you would generate a HD wallet. Uh, you would you would uh, generate a public key from that HD wallet and put that public key into the configuration file. And so from that point on, you can use that HD wallet to sign uh, admin transactions. So you, you mean can... a, a Bitcoin HD wallet? Yeah. So we actually Open Chain uses the same elliptic curve as Bitcoin. So all the libraries that you can use uh, for signing transactions with Bitcoin, like uh, Bitcore, uh, Bitcoin J, and so on, you can use the same with Open Chain. Uh, so yeah, you generate HD Wallet and then you sign administrative transactions with that key. Uh, so like you can, uh, you know, change permissions on accounts. Um, yeah, the the structure of uh, of accounts is hierarchical, so you can you can set a permission at a you know at a top level, and that applies to all these sub accounts below that. Uh, you can well you can do a lot of things as as the admin. Uh, another setting that you can uh, configure is um, whether you want to allow uh, the end user to um, to issue their own assets. So if you want to have a ledger where anybody can issue their own assets, then you can turn you just set it to true, and that becomes possible. Uh, there's a few other settings, and then once this is all configured, you just set up uh, the the permissions on the ledger. And so permissions they have. Um, there's a number of permissions, so there's the right to spend money. So you you can associate an account with a public key and give it the right to spend money, which means then that uh, this public key is allowed to sign transactions spending money from that uh, account. There's also the right to receive money, uh, 
so you can by default you can either set it to uh, allowing everybody to receive money so in that case any account can receive money or you can uh, use like more uh, like um, more a pattern where you have to be whitelisted to be able to receive money so if you want to only allow your users to be able to receive money then you you set it to false by default and then you enable only some accounts uh, some public keys to receive uh, funds uh, and there's a few other things uh, you can also um, so you can store what's interesting is uh, because uh, with Bitcoin obviously it's a it's a common blockchain everybody shares the same blockchain so there's a lot of limitations in what data can be put in the in the blockchain but with open chain because you're the one who sort of it's your server it's running on your server so you're paying for the hosting costs so you can put as much data as you want basically there's no limit because uh, you know you're the one and it's not even really uh, you know it's not replicated on 6000 nodes so it's it's not as expensive even so you can store kilobytes or megabytes of data if you want and uh, you can also give the right to the users to store their own metadata so we use that metadata for a few different things you can, for example, define uh, the terms of service of uh, of your instance. So there's a special uh, piece of data that you would put, which is with a special name, and uh, the users, when they connect with their wallets, they will see that terms of services and they they have to accept it. For example, uh, you can also uh, we also use uh, this ability to store data, to store uh, asset definition on the ledger. So when you create an asset, uh, you can you can say, okay, this this asset is called. Uh, epicenter coins and uh, it has this icon and uh, this is the short name and so on much like you do and, with uh, colored coins yeah exactly except in the case of open chain it's actually stored in the ledger itself so it's all completely signed uh, all the way and it's part you know it's it's actually a transaction that creates that data and put it in the blockchain so it's all completely unified uh, with colored coins it was a bit more complicated because we cannot put so much data in the blockchain the bitcoin blockchain so instead we uh, store the data outside of the blockchain and we refer to it with a url so it's not as elegant uh, with open chain you can put their data completely and directly um, yeah so there's a few other things you can uh, you can have also uh, pointer records so you can have an account pointing to another account uh, with a pointing uh, with a pointer record so whenever someone sends money to that uh, source account they automatically get forwarded to the other account um, yeah so there's plenty of things plenty of features like this that can be done by using data records Okay, and and so you also have client side libraries then, so then you can easily deploy wallets and applications that use uh, open as or sorry that use uh, open chain. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean we have so the, uh, the the wallet has been open sourced and it's uh, completely web based because we're talking about uh, HTTP APIs, so it's pretty easy to program um, a web based interface to deal with that, uh, and it's completely open source. And actually, we use. Um, you know, there's no complicated things really happening in there. It's just, uh, I, I would say the most complicated thing that happens is signing the transaction. And for that, we use BitCore, which is the library that the open source library from BitPay. Uh, and it's just a few lines of code with BitCore. You just sign the transaction and then send it to the server. Uh, so it's actually pretty simple. And, you know, it, it's uh, in any language, you could deal with it pretty easily. Okay. And so regarding the uh, capacity, so, you know, you're Starbucks, for instance, and you deploy an instance, and then all of a sudden you start getting into the maybe thousands of transactions per second. Uh, how does the server architecture have to scale? Is it is it pretty low balance? Or, you know, if you start getting into those high ser transaction volumes, do you have to have like, perhaps, uh, you know, a pretty hefty server or, you know, distributed servers around the world that are managing these ledgers? That are validating transactions. Yeah, it's a very good question. So actually, uh, OpenChain has kind of this uh, modular architecture, and we have this concept of storage engine. And uh, you know, by default, it uses uh, just a simple, you know, SQL database locally. Uh, but we plan to add more support for more storage engine engines, and uh, potentially you would be able to store data in in the, like scale out databases like Ascendra or MongoDB. And those are, you know, made for scale, you know, you can, like Facebook and uh, Twitter and those guys, they store, um, you know, thousands of terabytes of data in those databases. And and uh, when you will be able to use uh, those databases as a storage engine, then, uh, yeah, it's then it's easy to implement scale out. Uh, you would have, you know, you can have like 16 nodes, uh, shard, you know, sharding the data and uh, storing each some part of the data with replication and so on. Uh, so you can ensure high availability as well as... Uh, um, you know, scalability, scale out. Um, so it, it, that would be a way to scale. Basically, we we rely on. Uh, Will that be possible? Because um, 
I mean, it, it seems like the, or, or would you have to compromise on, for example, the instant confirmation then? Uh, if you start charging? Really, no, you yeah. Um, so not really, I mean, you would, uh, you would still commit uh, the uh, the database into Cassandra. So you you have different. Uh, so, so you know I don't know if uh, people are familiar with Cassandra, but there's many uh, write modes, and there's some write modes where you have um, uh, you know delayed consistency. Some of them where you have instant consistency. Uh, if you use so there's a system like a system called Quorum, uh, where you write to a majority of nodes. And uh, by doing that, you ensure that um, there's actually, you know, it works actually with consensus, you know, Cassandra implements its own consensus mechanism. So when you write to a majority of nodes, you know that the data is committed. And even if you lose a node, uh, you, you don't lose the data. So you can still, uh, you can still have instant confirmations. Uh, it might be a little bit slower, of course, because now you're talking to different nodes. Um, but this is the type of thing you can scale, you know, like, you know, like I said, uh, Facebook, Twitter are using those, uh, those databases and they, they obviously have a very large scale. Today's magic word is open, O-P-E-N. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener award. So regarding the security model and the sort of link to the privacy model, um, could you have a an open chain ledger that is behind a firewall? Um, say you want to have sort of a private a private uh, ledger. How would you prevent? I guess your um, observer nodes from leaking the data outside of that, you know, behind that firewall, if if indeed you could. Yeah, so it, there's plenty of uh, models that can work. So, but the fact that it's a server, it means that you, if you shield it, if you put it behind a firewall, uh, you can prevent anybody from accessing, accessing it. So if you want to use it internally for your organization, but you don't want to let other people accessing it, uh, you just use it on an intranet, for example, uh, or on, into your local network, um, and then only it's then it can only be used with from within your organization. And you can still have observer nodes, uh, but they will be inside the organization, obviously. Um, so yeah, they, like the kind of architecture, you know, network architecture that people have been doing in the past twenty years, this this type of thing completely applies. Uh, one thing that's also interesting is because it's exposing HTTP interfaces, you can put it behind Cloudflare. So Cloudflare, for, for you know, I don't know if you're familiar, it's a service that uh, provides DDoS protection. Uh, so they uh, sort of uh, intercept the calls and then forward them to your own server. Uh, so they have a free tier, uh, which is very good. And then they have like pro editions and so on. But they basically protect against DDoS attacks and uh, a lot of different attacks. They provide caching and so on. And uh, so you can, you know, if you want, you can put your server behind Cloudflare to protect it against DDoS. Uh, like everything that works with web servers today, there's a lot of tools that works with web servers. You know, for 15 years, a lot of things have been running on web servers. Everything, all of this can work uh, with OpenChain because it's using HTTP interfaces. Okay, that's interesting. But it, but so regarding privacy, though, if you're use if you're using OpenChain behind a firewall, you'd still have to trust the lowest common denominator, not not to. Uh, to leak the data of your ledger outside the system. Yeah, if you want to use it just internally, then you would not expose it at all to the outside and the observers would also have to be inside. Uh, you would need to make sure that you, I mean, you, would, you wouldn't really have, you wouldn't really be able to have observers outside of the network because they couldn't connect to the validator node. Uh, but yeah, and then uh, if you, you know, it depends what, what the scope of that instance is supposed to be. If you want to expose it to the outside, then uh, yeah, you. you you can open the firewall, but if you want it to remain uh, internal, then you need to make sure that the validator node and all the observer nodes are within the firewall. So, so one of the use cases that uh, it seems like this is tiered for, and, and you mentioned it before, is, is the idea of, of trading, right? Because you certainly write that blockchains aren't very good at that. You know, I mean, Bitcoin certainly wouldn't be useful for that. And, and then even if you take like permission chains, uh, you still have problems, right? As you mentioned, right? If there's like a few second confirmation time, well, that's probably too slow. So uh, one of the interesting things here, and I'm curious how that's going to work, 
is is the idea that or, or would you in a, in a trading use case let's say we want to do a stock market with open chain would you have a, a different open chain for each stock and would those be issued then by the company or would would like let's say nasdaq would have like one open chain that includes uh, all the stock of the entire stock market yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so right now there is this uh, this uh, concept of uh, uh, stock depositories, which is uh, like the DTCC in the US and uh, there's a few also in Europe. Um, and this is where the stocks are held ultimately. So those uh, those companies could be the ones running uh, an open chain ledger and uh, you know have people, you know, instead of having this this very uh, tiered approach where you have like a repository, then you have brokers, then you have the exchange. You could have the, the depository holding the stocks, exposing a um, open chain ledger, and then everybody could connect to that directly. So you kind of eliminate a few intermediaries. Uh, that's one way to do it. And then you could, as far as the exchanges are concerned, you know, if you're a NASDAQ and you, you're, you want to run an exchange, uh, you would have maybe a second instance where you have uh, tokens that represents um, uh, which is kind of a proxy for a token on the at the DTCC, for example. So um, and then uh, you still don't have to do reconciliation because everything kind of happens automatically. You can have like a, a smart contract in a way that makes sure that every, everything is always in sync. Uh, but still, uh, but then you can you, the Nasdaq has the ability to have their own um, um, sort of a small uh, instance where all the trading happens. Um, and for like you know to go back to your first question, if you would have different uh, instances per different stocks, um, I mean everything is possible. You can have multiple. You can have just one instance with many different stocks on it. Uh, but I think for again for scalability, just very practical reason, it's, it would probably be better to have uh, one server per security. Uh, but um, you know, definitely there's many architectures possible uh, depending on you know on the on the creativity. So, so that um, that kind of leads into the next question, no? Because if you start having a uh, hundred chains with one chain per security, uh, how can those interoperate? Yeah, basically, uh, there's the concept of a gateway. So you can establish a gateway from one chain to another, and what it does is it creates. Um, let's say you have Starbucks points on the Starbucks chain, and then you want to have a like. You want to have like an exchange for Starbucks points, so that's exchange for Starbucks points. Uh, you on that on there you would have a special token that that is a proxy for the actual Starbucks points on the on the Starbucks chain, and um, so you would as far as Starbucks would be uh, is concerned, you would be an account, and when someone would want to transfer a Starbucks point uh, from the main Starbucks chain onto the exchange chain, they would send it to that special account that you own. And now you, uh, as the exchange, you you kind of own that point, and you create the equivalent on the on the uh, exchange chain, and then you give it to that user uh, because you can map that user uh, in different ways. Like the easiest way to do it is by uh, I, uh, you know giving it to the same public key. So as you know, as long as the person has the public key, you know that it has it because it sent uh, the Starbucks point from that public key. So you can give it to the same public key, but on the other chain. And then on the exchange chain, you can run uh, your exchange. You know, you can have rules, uh, you know, f specifically for that exchange. And people can cash out uh, from the exchange by sending it to again to a special account on the exchange chain, which unlocks the coins on the main Starbucks chain. So what I just explained, it's actually very similar to the concept of side chains. Uh, this is actually, you know, the exchange chain would be a side chain of the main Starbucks chain, uh, and you can actually have. Uh, a chain, like a, an open chain instance, which would be a side chain of the Bitcoin blockchain as well. This is also possible. But but so yeah, let's talk about that example, right? Because let's say you you had you know you allowed to put Bitcoin on some open chain, so that means you would put them in a certain account that would be controlled, I presume, by the validator of the open chain on the Bitcoin network, and then that validator would issue you a Bitcoin token on the open chain. Is that how it will work? Yeah, that's how it would work. Uh, although it's it's possible to decentralize this a bit, because we're talking about Bitcoin. So uh, a setup that would be interesting is to it it actually doesn't really have to be the validator. Although it's probably no, it actually doesn't even have to be the validator. It could be a third party company or a group of companies, which uh, come together. They create a multi-sig address, 
uh, amongst all of those. Uh, and and that multisig address is the gateway. So when you want to send uh, Bitcoins from the main chain to the side chain, which is like that special uh, uh, open chain instance, they send it to the multisig address. So it gets locked by all those, let's say five companies. Uh, and then those five, uh, and then they, and then a token is issued on the side chain. Then, you know, people can trade. That token represents exactly one Bitcoin. People can trade on the chain. And when they want to cash out, they send it to an address, which is again controlled by those five companies, but on the side chain. And um, and then the five companies uh, unlock the coins on the main chain and give it back to you on the main chain. Right, but I mean, I, I can see that making some sense, especially like let's say if you think that one of those multi-sig addresses or something would be controlled by people running like observer nodes on the open chain, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that would be yeah. But but still though, because if you say there is an account that's like controlled by the same three entities, let's say on the open chain, I mean in the end, every account on the open chain, you know, if if the validator can reverse transactions and yeah, but this is where it, it, this is a very good uh, observation, uh, and what would happen is that the uh, the five or three entities that control that multisig address, they would be observing no observer nodes. And uh, if they realize that the administrator reverses transactions and they don't agree with this, uh, the reversal of those transactions, and uh, let's say um, you know you you have money that you shouldn't really have, and they know like the five observer nodes agree that you shouldn't really have that money, then they just wouldn't sign the transaction when you try to cash out. So when you try yeah. to cash out, you still get need to get the signature of those five uh, companies. And because they're observing and they realize that something was not right, they can just refuse to give you your money because you, you have money that you shouldn't have. So even if the administrator reverses transaction, then the observer nodes still have the power of controlling the coins in that multisig address. Yeah, that's right, right. Yeah, so you, you could have that security that the Bitcoins would be, yeah, presumably reasonably secure, at least if the observer nodes would be able to see uh, and know what's going on, right? Because it might not, I'm not sure if it will always be obvious when... Uh... I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the service, uh, those five companies, they would run probably special software to identify any type of uh, transaction that, that's not right, because, you know, they, they would be running this type of service. Uh, but this setup is actually exactly what a federated sidechain is. So this is, you know, this is basically, you can set up a federated sidechain yeah, yeah, like this on open yeah. chain. Yeah. So before we wrap up, um, I'd like to get maybe your sort of your your views on where the Bitcoin ecosystem is going, and you know, we've seen a proliferation of these protocols uh, and standards that are built on top of Bitcoin, and you know it seems like it was just yesterday that you know Bitcoin was going to be the currency that was going to you know, everybody was going to use it, but now we're seeing that in fact. You know, companies and enterprises and sort of larger players are building all this infrastructure on top of Bitcoin and you know using Bitcoin not necessarily as a payment mechanism but as rails on which other protocols are implemented. Um, where do you see this going in the next five to ten years? Yeah, I think I see Bitcoin becoming more of an infrastructure service. You know, like this, th the fact that you can uh, publish a hash and it becomes immutable. You know, like like OpenChain is doing. It's it's very valuable. And uh, I think people are going to realize that uh, it's you know Bitcoin is going to it's going to stay as a store of value just because of that uh, that value that it provides to as an infrastructure uh, as a currency. I don't know if I see it as a currency because there's still a lot of problems to overcome uh, for people to use it as you know for payments and this type of things. I mean it works okay, but uh, the user experience you know when you try to pay in a store, I mean it's not great right now. There's a lot of progress to be done, and I'm sure. It is going to evolve over the next five years and ten years. It's like, uh, you know, it's it's such a long time for this type of things. You know, five years ago, Bitcoin was uh, barely barely existed. So, uh, who knows? You know how the user experience will have, will have improved in five to ten years. Um, but yeah, like those companies, uh, you know, there's always this debate ever, like with the blockchain without Bitcoin versus Bitcoin. I think it's like two different use cases, two very different things. Uh, those companies trying to build a blockchain, what they want is like a, like a secure system with like nice properties like you know auditability and uh, you know transparency, you know digital signatures. They're not necessarily interested in, uh, in uh, uh, as 
uh, for it as a payment, like as a as a commodity, like Bitcoin is. But Bitcoin itself as a commodity is very useful for some things as well, which is not what the banks are interested in. But uh, it's different use cases, but it's still very interesting. Like the fact that um, you know you can store the fact that it's like gold but digital. You know, so if you want to buy gold, uh, it's not very easy. If you want to buy physical gold, you have to store it somewhere. So definitely using Bitcoin is a much easier way to do that. Um, you know, Bitcoin has also has this property of uh, censorship resistance. So, I mean, okay, um, it's definitely useful for uh, some of the illegal use cases. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but at least, you know, it, it's useful there. And just because of that, it's not going to disappear. Um, so it definitely has its use cases. It's just not what the banks are looking at or like, you know, the financial institutions are looking at. It's two different, I think, I think blockchain is kind of in the middle but it's like very like two different uh, angles really but they both have their merits yeah absolutely so when it comes to uh, you like coin prism as a company is your plan now to build a business around open chain uh, and also is it because for a long time it was uh, coin prism was basically mainly you is that still the case or is there a, a, a larger team now uh, so it's still me, the main person on the team. Uh, I mean, I'm working with like a few people part time, but yeah, like uh, we're still looking to grow the team, uh, you know, in the in the next few uh, months, uh, hopefully. Uh, but uh, as far yeah, as far as product goes, uh, yeah, obviously, Coin Prism and Coinload Coins are still uh, still around, and we we want to you know also keep our focus on that. And as a matter of fact, we'll um, we'll also allow uh, pegging. Uh, Open assets uh, tokens from the main chain to us to a uh, open chain instance. So you know, like I was talking about uh, using open chain as a side chain. Well, it's not only going to be for Bitcoin; it's also going to be for Coinbase coins. So, and we're going to you know enable that kind of scenario so that people who uh, want kind of the best of both worlds, they can use the open chain for scaling, and then they can then go back to the main chain for uh, settlement or, or whatnot. Um, so it's kind of two sides of the spectrum and we still want to you know to be able to have offerings on both sides on the permissionless side which is kernel coin and bitcoin because there are some use cases where it just works better and then on the permission side as well because you know there's also use cases where permission uh, makes more sense so we want to again keep the offering on both sides and be able to offer to people uh, what they what's the best solution for them cool great no that sounds fantastic uh, thanks so much for coming on, Flavia. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, and to listeners, thanks so much for listening. It's uh, it's always a pleasure. And so we, we put out new episodes every Monday, and you can subscribe to episodes on iOS, iTunes, SoundCloud, or, of course, watch the videos on YouTube. Now, if you're a loyal fan and if you're listening, you know what's coming now, which is that we are doing this, uh, this campaign where essentially if you leave us a, an iTunes review, some feedback on the show then we are sending you a t-shirt then we're, we're almost out but we'll get new ones done so just email us at show at epicenterbitcoin.com if you do that so thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week bye